Now, let's get back to the complicated religious geography of the subcontinent, right? A great Hindu core with two wings of Islam to the northeast, to the northwest, with a transitional religion called the Sikh religion uh, in Punjab state to the northwest. Right? Now you remember when I was talking about uh, this circumstance in Nigeria, when the British took over in Nigeria, they favored, uh, amongst the larger groups in the country, they favored one of the smaller groups uh, of, of the larger populations. All right, in Nigeria, that was the Igbos. And they gave the Igbos uh, a certain uh, privileges in terms of opportunities in the police, in the military, all right, in the colonial administration. Those are the good opportunities, if not the only local, uh, uh, only opportunities for the local population. All right. Well, they were given to the Igbos, and you remember in Nigeria, the implications were enormous there. The other groups in the country are going to feel resentful of the Igbos who have privilege that they ordinarily wouldn't have. Well, that was the same thing on the subcontinent. The British came to the subcontinent and favored the Sikhs, given the Sikhs, uh, making the Sikhs an overrepresented minority in the governmental structure and in the army. The Sikhs only represent, roughly speaking, 2% of the population of the subcontinent, and yet they were massively overrepresented in these good military and administrative positions and that is going to cause a lot of animosity towards the Sikhs by other groups in the country. The implications for that are enormous. As you can see here in 1947 the subcontinent, all this colored area if you would in here, breaks free. All right, from the British Empire, it's, it breaks free with the British pull out, shall we say. Now, immediately upon pulling out in 1947, these areas in green where the Muslims were located said to themselves, we are Muslims and do, don't want to be part of a larger India because we've had a contentious relationship with Muslims. Excuse me, we've had a contentious relationship with Hindus. We've often been considered second-class citizens. We don't want to be run by a Hindu-dominated India, which we would if we stayed in. So at the, in that same year, 1947, these areas in green broke free and formed a country called Pakistan. All right? And you can see why religion has been a centrifugal force, because the Indian or the Asian subcontinent, if you like, has broken apart immediately upon its independence from the British in 1947 based on religious uh, uh, criteria. And thus we have Pakistan. Now you know where Pakistan came from. And understand when Pakistan came into existence in 1947, it was comprised of two pieces, West port, the western portion and the eastern portion. This was one country though, just that it had two pieces. All right? And it's based on religion. Okay, now, Now, what you want to take note of here is that when, Pac when this border was being drawn here to separate Pakistan from India in 1947, you know what, it, it wasn't that difficult to draw that border in this area here where I have the cursor, because this is a dry arid population, excuse me, a dry arid zone, and the populations are, there's a less dense population in here, by and large. Don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting it was easy. But it's easier in a desert zone where you have low, low population densities. And you understand the nationalism, the religious nationalism is going on. If you were a Hindu on this side of the boundary when, this, when Pakistan was coming to existence, you might want to consider getting over here in India. And if you were a Muslim on this portion uh, in, in India at the time when this boundary was being drawn, you might want to consider getting into Pakistan. All right. This was a bloody affair. All right. I always have to simplify. But this was a bloody affair, where long-standing animosities, often whipped up by religious nationalists, whipped up all this mutual hatred, resulting in massacres. All right, 
as this image suggests, the amount of death in this process cannot be overstated. We can't go into the fine details, but it was rather astonishing. Now, if it's easier to draw a partition line in arid regions, it's not easy, but it's easier, you can understand the problem when you have to draw that partition when you start getting up here and around Punjab state and certainly when you come up into Kashmir these uh, not to the uh, northern portions of Kashmir but these population destinies are pretty high in here it's going to get particularly hard to draw the the uh, the partition line especially here in Punjab remember Punjab was the richest state within India right in here and you're going to have to draw a partition line in here that's going to be a problem so you've got to decide where to draw your partition line can you postulate what both Hindus in India and Muslims can both agree on in terms of where that dividing line is going to, to draw to be drawn well you can figure out that in a hurry all right when you look at this map can you understand how they both could agree that the partition line is going to go right through the Sikh dominated area in Punjab all right because remember both sides had hostilities or animosity towards the Sikhs who were favored by the British so you could understand how they can both are gonna say look let's draw the partition line right through the Punjab so and so when you you can see here Punjab actually extends most people don't realize it but it extends into Pakistan over here but uh, and, and the, the Sikh uh, the the Indian portion of Punjab state is uh, not the only Punjabi area historically nevertheless when we talk about Punjab we're usually talking about Indian Punjab here all right so you can understand how the Sikhs found that they had their homeland or their home territory uh, partitioned all right you can understand how that was going to be a very violent and ugly process all right now it becomes more of a problem as you get up into this area up here into Kashmir because now you got to draw your partition line and when they got the Kashmir you can understand the difficulties here Kashmir the population is predominantly Muslim the populations are predominantly Muslim but the elite governance was Hindu. It had a Maharaja. Therefore, it becomes a little difficult on how, what are you going to do with Kashmir as you try to divide the partition line? Do you make it part of India or do you make it part of Pakistan? Now, make a long story short, ultimately, to the credit of both India and Pakistan, Kashmir was allowed to make its choice and I say Kashmir, I'm talking about the leadership, which would have been the Hindu leadership. And if you're the Hindu leadership, you had a problem. If you choose to go with Muslim-dominated Pakistan, you're going to lose your power on your position, which the Hindu leadership of Kashmir didn't want to do for obvious reasons. These Muslims are breaking free from Hindu dominated India because they don't want to be dominated by Hindus. They're certainly not going to allow a Hindu dominated Kashmir section within them. All right. But if you're the Hindu leadership of Kashmir and you say, hey, look, uh, what we'll do is go with India, all right, what's going to happen is your Muslim majority in the country is going to rise up against you. They're going to say, hey, look, we should be Muslim. We are a majority. All right. So what the Kashmir, what the Maharaj, the the Hindu leadership of Kashmir decided to do in '47 was it said essentially we'll be independent, we'll stay independent of both. All right, and that might momentarily seem like a viable solution. It is not, because what's going to happen is your Muslim majority is still going to say, well, what difference does it make if we're independent? We're still a Muslim majority dominated by a Hindu, and we're going to rise up. And that's exactly what occurred. And once you get an uprising of Muslims, what do you think the Hindu majority is going, the uh, Hindu governance of Kashmir is going to say? It's going to say, look, okay, since we have a, an uprising, let's join India. So Kashmir, by 
choice of the leadership decides to join India and therefore we can understand how Kashmir is going to be a problem all right because Pakistan is going to resent that as well as the Muslim majority population who's saying we don't want to be part of India and so Kashmir becomes a disputed zone between India and Pakistan which by and large however imperfectly and I'll flesh out some details later about that remains to this very day all right that issue is not resolved, although India considers it resolved. Pakistan does not. I'll come back to that here in a bit, in any case. And by the way, um, look over here to the eastern portion of Pakistan over here. They had to draw this partition line in here to separate Muslim from Hindu. And this, these are extremely densely populated locations. You can understand the difficulties in drawing this. In fact, you can see it here. Look what happens here. Uh, West Bengal remains part of India. All right. East Bengal does not. All right. East Bengal has remained part of Pakistan in 1947. All right. Uh, I'll talk about how it turned into another country after that, but that's uh, getting ahead of myself in any case. In fact, your text will give you a definition for drawing a boundary like this. When you just make up a boundary that no that did not previously function as a boundary, that had no administrative authority as a value. It's much like the Western states of the United States, all of those artificial boundaries that have no cultural significance prior to being drawn up. All right, Your text will give you a definition for this term, uh, for this uh, phenomena, and it's called a superimposed political boundary. A political boundary drawn over a cultural landscape in which such a boundary had not previously existed or functioned. All right, good to know. Now, 